Uh, today, we're going to talk about the process of vitrectomy. And basically, I'd like to go over the um, the essentials of what a vitrectomy operation is. Uh, a vitrectomy, for many of you, might be the process by which you get rid of the floaters uh, that have been plaguing you for some time. Again, I'd like to go, I'll go through the slide presentation and then uh, open up to Q&A. Uh, I apologize, it's just not very feasible with this setup to turn everyone's audio on. So as far as audio is concerned, you're just going to have to put up with my voice uh, and then I'll read your questions and answers as best I can afterwards. So let's get started. So this is the process of vitrectomy. Uh, my name is Randy Wong. I am a retina specialist located in Fairfax, Virginia in the United States. That's about 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. And many of you are here because you've been following me on my uh, website, vitrectomyforfloaters.com. I first want to define what are, one second, the characteristics of floaters. And when many of you write or email or discuss with me in person about floaters, we get into extravagant uh, descriptions about the size, shape, and color of the vitreous floaters. And I hate to say it, that really doesn't have much clinical value to me uh, as your doctor. Because at the end of the day, the most important component about whatever's in your vision is that they move back and forth with eye movement. So no matter what size they are, no matter what shape they are, no matter what color, whether or not they're dots, cobwebs, or worms, as long as the most important feature to me is whether or not they're floating. And by definition, they should be moving back and forth, to and fro, up and down, when you move your eye back and forth. So by definition, if that's true, whatever you're seeing has to be located in the vitreous. And that's very important for me to confirm because if we're going to talk about removing the vitreous, whatever you're seeing better be in the vitreous uh, because that's what we're going to remove. So vitrectomy is the fancy term for basically removing the vitreous. The idea is identifying or confirming that whatever you're seeing is indeed suspended within the vitreous gel of the eye. And therefore, if we move it, you should get a lot better. Make sense? I hope so. So floaters, as I just alluded to, uh, they exist only in the vitreous because that's where they live. That's where they are. And therefore, removing the vitreous as a whole should be therapeutic. And if you can look at the illustration here on the right where the artist has uh, drawn in the floaters, we're basically a vitrectomy will just basically be removing all of this stuff so that you would have a clear pathway uh, through your cornea, through your lens, and so light hits your mac macula uninterrupted by all this floaters or debris. So vitrectomy is the eye operation to remove the vitreous and thereby the floaters. Floaters are a generic term for basically anything that you see moving in your eye. They can be blood. Certain diseases may cause bleeding in the middle of your eye, or certain diseases may cause bleeding uh, into the vitreous. Certain eye conditions can cause inflammation in the eye. So you can have something called a vitritis, which is very similar to having, if you will, arthritis in the eye, but what you'll be seeing would be inflammatory cells. There are certain types of systemic arthritic conditions where um, inflammation intermittently occurs in the eye, and they, these people also complain of floaters. Uh, if you develop a tear in your retina, you could get floaters that are either blood or from some of the cells that are underneath the retina. Um, a common condition called asteroid hyalosis uh, can sometimes uh, be bad enough that the patients themselves uh, see floaters as well. But in most cases, 
um, most of my patients that I talk to about removing floaters, uh, they just have normal opacities in the vitreous, not related to blood, not related to inflammatory cells. There's no uh, tear or retinal detachment, and they do not have asteroid hylosis. So most patients that I see that have made it to this juncture have basically normal eyes, but they've just got these opacifications in the vitreous, and they're driving you nuts. So once we make the, you make the initial appointment to come see me for examination, and I have to do this before I operate, um, the initial consultation has a variety of purposes. And at the end of the day, what I really need to do is I, I need to assess your overall health of your eyes. Uh, when you come, we'll check your vision. We'll check your eye pressure. The slit lamp examination is the machine that you place your head, where you place your head, and we're able to look at your eyes under magnification and with certain types of light. And we're looking at the different parts of the eye. We're looking at your cornea, your pupil, the lens, which may or may not have uh, cataract formation. Um, we're looking at your retina specifically looking at the clarity of your vitreous. I want to make sure that your macula is healthy as well as your optic nerve and a couple other portions of your eye. I basically need to make sure that what you're seeing is not, a relate, is not related to uh, treatable disease. So that's the purpose of the slit lamp examination and the dilated exam. That's when you get put the drops in your eyes so your pupils dilate, and then we can look into the inside structures of your eyes, including the vitreous. Uh, particularly germane to uh, this patient population is we're all very sensitive about whether or not you have a cataract. So I want to make sure that you do uh, do not have a cataract, or if you do, I obviously want to make sure that you're aware that you have a cataract. Remember that everybody, uh, as we age, everybody, regardless of who you are, will eventually develop a cataract. Um, <clears throat> for those patients where uh, I may consider operating, I also want to know whether or not there is a posterior vitreous detachment, uh, because this will help me counsel you a little bit better as to what we're going to do in the in the whole course of the vitrectomy. And I'll talk a little bit more about posterior vitreous detachment in just a few moments. Again, the during the initial consultation, this exam is not focused, haha, -ha, sorry for the pun, on confirming the presence of floaters. I think if you've been following, following me long enough, uh, you've heard me say or you've um, seen me write that it's not my purpose to identify the floaters that are bothering you. Um, my feeling is that I should be able to see every component of, of your vitreous, whereas you should not be able to see your, your vitreous. Obviously, there are some floaters in your eyes that are bothering you, but I can't tell which floaters, in most cases, I can't tell which floaters that I see are actually the ones bothering you. When I operate, since my goal is to remove most of the vitreous, it doesn't really matter that I... I can see exactly what's plaguing you because I should have the ability to remove 80 to 90 percent of the vitreous, which is where most of your floaters would be located. Now I understand this is very different from uh, most of your eye doctors uh, that have examined you before. Most of your eye doctors, especially if you're young, have realized that you don't have any floaters that they can see. So there's this is more evidence that you know, you really don't know what you're talking about. I've learned that, especially in the young, it's ridiculous to try and for me to find the same floaters that you're seeing. Uh, how do I know this? By experience, because just about every patient that I've operated on, um, well, basically all, have noted either a significant reduction or complete removal. And this includes patients that, in where I can't see uh, any floaters at all. So this is more the normal than the abnormal. The cataract issue is is a little bit confusing and it's obviously anxiety provoking, but here's my stance on cataract formation and, and uh, vitrectomy. First of all, let's look at the picture on the right. The cataract is the M&M shaped size lens, which is inside your eye and is right behind your iris. Now, 
my official statement in 2015 about cataract formation and vitrectomy with me is it can happen, but it's really not expected. Um, it can happen if you've got a pre-existing cataract, and it is possible that the vitrectomy may increase the rate at which the cataract will form. So be it. Keep in mind, as I said a couple slides ago, everybody gets cataracts as we age, regardless of whether or not you have an operation or not. That's very important for you to understand. Cataracts are, are a normal fact of life. The real question is whether or not vitrectomy increases the rate at which cataracts form. In certain types of vitrectomies, for when I do vitrectomy for retinal detachment or something called macular holes, absolutely, you can expect cataracts right after uh, the operation. And by right after, I mean several, several months to a year. That would be relatively quick. But it's been my experience that people that have straight vitrectomy or straight FOV, very, very few, especially over the last three to five years, uh, have had to have cataract surgery within the first year or two. Um, and I just want to alleviate kind of that concern. So my stance is that, and I'm not saying I do anything special. It's been my observation that when we operate uh, in Virginia, um, Cataract formation can happen, but I wouldn't really expect it. If you do have pre-existing cataracts, I think you need, you need to know about it. My guess is once we get rid of your floaters, the effects of the pre-existing cataracts are going to be more noticeable to you. Um, but this is something we'll talk about if we ever meet face-to-face. -face. And then one last time, remember that everyone develops cataracts in their life, and I mean everyone, with or without, without FOV or vitrectomy. What are the major risks of vitrectomy? Well, the major risk, the major one that I'd be concerned with is whether or not we caused you to go blind. Blindness is possible if you, if you get an infection inside the eye, and this is called endophthalmitis. So if you were to get an in, internal infection in, in the eye, that could be potentially, isn't always, blinding. And the chance of that from vitrectomy is less than one chance in 10,000. Cataract surgery, on the other hand, that same infection can occur uh, uh, as often as one chance in 2,000. So just to put it in perspective, with, in terms of uh, safety or in terms of blindness, vitrectomy is actually much safer than cataract surgery. The other thing that I worry about is whether or not retinal detachments can occur. And retinal detachments can occur in any eye surgery, including vitrectomy, including cataract surgery. It can happen because a tear in the retina can occur, and that tear can lead to retinal detachment. By definition, retinal detachments could potentially cause blindness, although they usually don't, um, or they could cause significant loss of vision. It would require a separate operation to fix. It would actually require a vitrectomy, of all things, uh, to fix the retinal detachment. And then I'm going to leave it up to you as to whether or not you would call cataracts a complication. But l since we talked about it uh, in this discussion, I listed cataracts as at least a pos possible risk. There is some discussion about hypotony, and I think just like the cataract issue, I think there's a little bit of uh, confusion about exactly what hypotony is. Hypotony to me is when I take the patch off your eye the next morning that your pressure is either zero or quite low. And this happens, this is kind of a byproduct of using 25 gauge uh, vitrectomy systems. That is that the 25 gauge system, and we'll talk about that coming up, uh, means that the instruments that I use are so tiny that I don't have to use stitches to close your eye. And therefore, your, your stitch, the operation is what we call sutureless. The advantages of sutureless are, are quite a few. It reduces the time I need to operate because I have to do less cutting as part of the operation. That in turn means there's a lot less uh, tissue to heal so that your recuperative period is much faster. I would say about 80 to 90 percent of the time uh, we have no problems with pressure on the very next day. 
So when I talk about hypotony, I'm really talking about what's the chance your pressure is quite low the day after surgery. Um, I don't have any experience with hypotony well after the surgery. And I've read or I get many questions about what I do with hypotony several weeks after the operation. And I'm really confused because that just doesn't happen. It's never expected after a normal vitrectomy. Um, if you were to come to me to, in 2015, uh, I would tell you that I would prefer to use a 25 gauge system because it's easier on the eye. It's a, it allows me to do the operation uh, very efficiently, uh, including uh, with regard to time and it also in terms of removing the vitreous. Um, in older patients, I don't worry about using sutures to close the tiny little holes in your eye called sclerotomies uh, because for some reason, older patients never leak. It's the younger patients where I, I really have some worry about hypotony on the next day. So it's been my practice probably over the last year or so that uh, if you're young, uh, I'd recommend putting uh, sutures in your eye. So we don't, ha we don't even have to worry about having low pressure in your eye the next day. The corollary, however, is that you're going to feel like something's in your eye for a couple of days. It's quite benign. The sutures come out by themselves because they dissolve. And there will be some redness in your eye for about a month or two where, as these sutures are dissolving. But other than the cosmetic issue, it's really, it's really a very, there really almost is no trade-off.